Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's training titled Basics of Behavior Part 1, Reinforcement and ABC Data. My name is Marissa Eck, and I am a behavior analyst at the Ells for Autism Foundation. I'm really looking forward to this training today. Just as a reminder, today's training is eligible for CEU credits. Um, just make sure that you tune in the whole time. I will be giving you secret code words throughout the training just to make sure that you are here and present and uh, keeping a close ear to this training. Um, I will be embedding them throughout the training. And just a reminder, there's two. And uh, in order for you to get your CEU credits for attending this training, you will need to have those two secret code words. Um, so I will make sure that I say them clearly, loudly, and I spell them out for you so that you make sure you have them. All right, let's dive right on in. So here are our learning objectives for today. Attendees will gain a basic understanding of reinforcement. Attendees will learn the difference between positive and negative reinforcement. Attendees will review the five types of positive reinforcers and two types of negative reinforcers. Attendees will learn the ABC model and how to collect ABC data. And attendees will gain an understanding of antecedents, behaviors, and consequences. Just to reiterate, this is an intro um, sort of presentation where we're going to be talking about really the foundations of behavior, applied behavioral analysis, and the different things that are super, super important for us to be fluent in prior to doing anything more intensive. So I just want to reiterate, this might feel a little bit introductory. Um, if you are someone who is a behavior analyst who has a lot of experience, you might be like, oh gosh, another intro presentation. Please bear with me. Um, this is something that I'm very passionate about and it's getting everybody to understand the basics of behavior um, in order for us to look at the big picture. So if this is also your first presentation where you have no idea what you're looking at, you're like, what is the ABC model? What's reinforcers? Uh, is it negative? Doesn't negative mean bad? You know, I, uh, I've heard it all and I'm with you. And um, I want you to feel comfortable to um, listen to what I'm going to be talking about today. Write down any questions you might have. Feel free to email me after our training. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing any feedback you have. But again, just bear with me that this is a foundational presentation. That is why it is titled what it is titled. <laughs> so let's continue. Part one, reinforcement. So I made this table for myself when I was studying for the exam a few years ago, and it has really carried its weight. Uh, it is something that I refer to often when I'm training my staff, when I need to just remember what I'm talking about. So I would suggest taking a screenshot of this for yourself if you are someone who, um, like me, needs is a visual learner and really needs some sort of visual support in memorizing these different um, principles. So I think this could be helpful for you. If not, no, no pressure. I won't know if you screenshot it. Um, but just, just a tip. It could be helpful if you're studying for the exam or if sometimes I have this printed out in my office space and just as a reminder for myself, like, what am I talking about? Oh, right. Okay. Um, okay. So positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. Let's start with positive reinforcement, something I'm sure many of my listeners today are familiar with. Positive reinforcement is when a behavior is followed immediately by the presentation of a stimulus that increases the future frequency of a behavior. So right below that, you'll see, this is how I remember it. Positive reinforcement equals adding something to increase a behavior. Thinking of the word adding, 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 positive, adding. An example, a baby increased the hitting of a mobile above their crib with their hands because it makes a pretty sound and maybe it has some cool um, reflection on it and they like it. So they're gonna be more likely to in the presence of that mobile hit it because they're adding something to increase, um, they're, it's adding something to their environment. So they're gonna keep hitting it because they like it. Um, another example of positive reinforcement in my own life, um, if I'm cooking dinner, and my partner happens to walk by and says, mm, that smells so good. I can't wait for dinner. I'm going to be more likely to use the ingredients that I'm using in the dinner I have in the future because they smell good. I'm getting positive feedback. My partner's excited about dinner. Um, and that's just positive reinforcement in everyday life. So here is an example. And now we're going to be talking about, oops, sorry. 
that negative reinforcement. And I just want to kind of put this disclaimer out there. I know that there are a lot of words that we're going to be talking about today and in part two that already have meaning in the English language. For example, the word negative. Negative oftentimes means something bad. And that is okay if your brain automatically thinks that because we were taught that, right? So in applied behavior analysis, unfortunately and fortunately, the founders of this science used a lot of words that are previously associated with other meanings. So you'll hear words like negative, extinction, consequence, and those words can sound a little icky um, if you're not familiar with what they mean in the context of applied behavior analysis. So I do wanna encourage you to kind of break free of those barriers just for the next hour as we are talking about negative reinforcement and hear the word consequence or hear the word extinction. Um, because yes, those words absolutely mean other things. Negative tends to mean bad, extinction means they no longer exist. And consequence sometimes means like a punishment or something like you're gonna have a consequence for your actions. But that actually means you're gonna have a consequence for your actions. Consequences happen naturally. Doesn't mean they're bad, they can be good. And in this context, we're gonna be talking about lots of good. So I just wanna encourage you to um, try to disassociate from those predisposed meanings. And it's going to take a lot of practice. I've been doing this for five years and I still sometimes have to remind myself that there are new meanings in our science and that's okay. So an example, um, again, you'll see the, the line below, it says negative reinforcement. And when you see Rx, it's not the same thing as a prescription. Rx in behavior analysis just means reinforcer. And if you see Bx, that's behavior. Fun little tip for you. Um, so negative reinforcement equals the removal of something to increase a behavior. So the commonality between positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement is that you're trying to increase the future likelihood of a behavior. And with positive reinforcement, you're adding something. And with negative reinforcement, you're removing something. I hope that's helpful. I know this is a concept that can be really murky and kind of confusing. Um, so please feel free to email me if you have any extra questions about that. Um, an example of negative reinforcement is Marissa takes an Advil and my headache stops. So I took an Advil and my headache was removed, therefore I'm gonna be more likely to take Advil in the future if I'm experiencing a migraine or a bad headache. But we're gonna be talking about other versions of these two examples. These are just introductory for you. So what does reinforcement do? Reinforcement is what comes before a specific, it makes what comes before a specific behavior very relevant. It also changes what comes after a behavior. It creates this thing that we like to call stimulus control, which makes responding in the presence of one thing more likely than the other. An example, to get cold water, a person is more likely to hold a cup under the blue tap at the water cooler, right? You want cold water, the motivation to have cold water. Um, I particularly love cold water more than anything. Um, and I wouldn't put my cup under the red tap because I can see that in the presence of the blue tap, I know cold water is available. So I'm gonna be more likely to put my cup under that. But of course, reinforcement depends on motivation. I'm only gonna hold my cup under the cold tap if I'm thirsty and if I want cold water. Maybe I want hot water to make some tea, or maybe I'm trying to have a cup of noodles, I don't know. Um, so it depends on the specific motivation and the context that we are in. So that's what reinforcement does. And I want you to really specifically think about the two top points that I have. It makes what comes before a specific behavior relevant and what comes after. We're going to be focusing really highly on looking at that linear sense of the before, the behavior, and the after. And that's called the ABC model, which we're going to get to today. Okay, so let me make sure that you guys can see my full title. How do we determine if something is a reinforcer? That's something I get, that question I get all the time. And it's a really important question. And here's why. Because for a lot of our learners that we support, 
in order for them to be comfortable learning a new skill, maybe something that's hard or something that is brand new, it's really important to have something available for them to feel like they can earn at the end of maybe a difficult or new activity. Or if we're working with a new learner, um, it's really, really important to pair, which is something that we're going to be talking about today, um, pairing your presence with something really fun and exciting and preferred. And it's also important to remember that something that is reinforcing um, has to be individualized to the learner. So just because maybe I like pizza or I really like M&Ms doesn't mean that I can project that same preference on someone else because maybe they don't. So just keep that in mind as we are continuing today. So how do we determine if something is a reinforcer? We use something called preference assessments. We sometimes will present potential preferred items in a variety of different ways. There are multiple types of preference assessments. I won't go into those because we could talk for a long time about the specifics of them. But essentially, you're gonna present preferred items in a certain type of order, whether it be free operant, they can go into a room and play with whatever, or maybe in a way that is, maybe they're placed on little plates, and they're gonna select something and then that, that something might be all done, they selected it, or it's something that you, they select and then it comes back in rotation. Um, and then you're gonna rank choices based on how often those items are chosen. And this helps to determine motivation. And other ways to do that is, and even knowing kind of where to start is deciding through a parent interview, chatting with a parent and say, hey, what does your learner in particular like a lot? Um, what is something that they are super willing to follow directions or just something that they like to have on their own? Sometimes parents will give you food options. Sometimes they will give you um, different things that they like to play with or watch, um, but parents know their learners the best. So start there. Then of course, you can always ask a teacher or a paraprofessional or a one-on-one -on -one or a teacher's assistant or a therapist, someone who works with that learner often and is able to observe their interests. And then what we have is called a free operant observation, which is just an opportunity for a learner to exist in a space and you kind of just observing and seeing what they gravitate towards. And that is another version of um, determining what could be pre preferred and then therefore a reinforcer. Um, sorry, this is also where you're looking at um, the duration that a student engages with an item in the natural environment. So not only are you giving them access to kind of the environment without any conditions, you're also seeing if perhaps they play with a toy for a longer amount of time than another toy. So you're looking at duration, which is the amount of time that they engage. Here is a really important disclaimer. Just because something is preferred doesn't mean it's a reinforcer until it's been assessed. So a student might show interest in M&Ms, but they might not prefer it more than hand flapping, Cheetos, yelling. Um, there's a variety of different things that our learners might prefer to have or do over getting an edible. So in order for us to determine if it is a reinforcer, we have to properly assess it. We can't just say, Johnny really likes M&Ms. Well, what does Johnny like really, what does Johnny like M&Ms uh, compared to? What is the comparison to? Do we have other options? Um, and again, something can be preferred, but it takes a formal assessment to determine if it's actually reinforcing. And I always make this kind of joke to my staff, whether it's funny, I don't know, they haven't told me yet, but I think I always say like, what would be our reinforcers? What's something that if you did a preference assessment and someone did it for you, what would be your top three favorite things? And I think it's important to, when we're doing this for our learners, to think of it for ourselves because we would not want the same thing every day. Maybe the first week, maybe even two weeks, it would be cool. But let's say we're in session for two hours a day and we're only getting access to Skittles because we one time liked Skittles more than something else. By like week three, we might get really full and satiate off of Skittles. And then we might see a change in my behavior because I'm like, I'm over the Skittles, enough with the Skittles. So I think this is a, an important kind of thought to have when you are doing this assessment for one of your learners, because just because something turns out to be preferred 
doesn't mean that you're going to use that for the rest of the time that you work with the learner. You always have to kind of be on your toes doing inter like intermittent preference assessments, maybe once a month, just to kind of see what they're interested in and see if their preference changes. And I think that's really, really important to keep motivation high. That's because they're our learners who, like I said earlier, will satiate or something or get full on it and be um, less likely to be reinforced by that item. And therefore their behavior may change. So just keep that in mind when you are looking at preference for your learner and trying to determine if something is a reinforcer. Here are our five types of positive reinforcers. I like this little mnemonic. It helps me to remember it. Also because my number one reinforcer is absolutely food, definitely pizza. So here we have eats. And eats are our five types of positive reinforcers. E for edibles, A activities, T tangibles, S social interactions, and another S for sensory. Okay. So what are edibles as reinforcers? So it's important for us to kind of talk about a variety of different examples, right? So edibles are any established reinforcing item in the form of a quickly consumable snack that is likely to increase the future likelihood or frequency of a behavior. Typically, we recommend using items that can be broken into smaller pieces and spread out more sustainably across the day. I especially encourage this for learners who have like a wide variety of snacks that they like, um, is using what we would call like a tackle box or a craft box where it has like those little tiny slots and keeping your snacks in there so that you can see you, there's transparency with what's available because usually those boxes are clear, but also um, it shows like the wide range and the wide variety of what's available. So some examples are candy, Pretzels, mints, chips, grapes, blueberries, cereal, crackers. This list could go on and on and could change for whichever learner you are supporting. So activities as reinforcers is the next thing we're gonna be chatting about. So what are activities as positive reinforcers? Activities are any established reinforcing event that a learner enjoys engaging in that is likely to increase the future frequency of a behavior. So examples of that include listening to music, jumping on the trampoline, maybe going for a walk, watching a preferred video, playing with toys, having a dance party, bouncing on a ball, going on a swing, going to the playground, and these are just examples that I can think of that happen within my four walls of the clinic I support. But this can absolutely, this list, I, like I said earlier, is not exhaustive by any means. Um, there are so many different ways that we can be creative in our environments um, to support different activities for sure. And next is what are tangibles as positive reinforcers? So tangibles, are any established reinforcing item that a learner enjoys engaging with that is likely to increase the future frequency of a behavior. They can be reinforcing on their own or exchanged for something else. So an example that I wanted to include is something that we call a token board or a token economy. This might be something that a lot of teachers or behavior analysts or even therapists are used to working with and using in their sessions to gain behavioral momentum and to be very transparent about what a learner is working to earn. So with that, tokens are considered tangibles because they are tiny little tokens that you're providing in response to a target behavior that you're trying to increase. It's considered a positive reinforcer if that learner is motivated by positive praise and the presentation of a token and therefore what they can exchange these tokens for. So that would all be established by using a preference assessment and we would have an understanding of what a learner would like to work for. So other examples, things that they could turn in their tokens for, or if they are a learner that does not have a token board, that's okay. They will also be able to have, they can also work for tangible reinforcer access, just not in the context of using a token board. It might use something like a first then board, maybe they use a point system, um, or it's just first we're going to do our work and then you can play with this. 
um, or kind of doing it based off of when they finish their work. It really is super individualized to the learner. So examples of tangibles are iPad, a spinning toy, puzzles, dolls or figurines, access to the computer, books, basketball, slinky, maybe preferred pictures, and again, tokens or points that can be exchanged for other things. Okay, so what is social reinforcement as a positive reinforcer? Social reinforcement is when any attention from others in the environment is an established reinforcer and is used to increase the future frequency of a behavior. So for social reinforcement to be an actual positive reinforcer, that means that interactions with others needs to be, in the presence of interaction with others, a behavior is gonna be more likely to occur. So that can be a good thing, and that can also sometimes get you in a pickle as a parent or as a clinician, because we wanna be thoughtful about the type of attention we're giving. And we're gonna to get to that later when we talk about functions of behavior, and attention is one of them. But in this sense, we're talking about a learner who has we've established that they really really enjoy getting positive praise that they like getting tickles hugs being held talking to an adult or talking to a teacher um having a fist pump laughing and thumbs up these are just different examples of social reinforcers and they are mediated by another person these are things that a, a learner would not engage with on their own so other components of social reinforcement include positive praise, saying, good job, way to go, awesome work. Physical reinforcement, like a high five, fist pump, thumbs up, hugs, cheering, clapping. Behavior specific praise. My most favorite version of social reinforcement is being very, very specific about what it is that you're giving praise for. So for a learner who might be doing gross motor imitation and saying, do this. Oh, you touched your nose. Way to go. So proud of you for touching your nose. Or for a learner who might be in a group lesson, um, letting them know that you are so proud of them for listening to the direction. It's also important to consider our tone and voice inflection when we are um, working with our learners. It's important that your tone should change when you're delivering praise. So for example, if I'm working with a learner and I'm saying, good job, Wow, so cool, awesome. That sounds pretty monotone, honestly kind of gross. I wouldn't want to hear that. If my boss was talking to me that way, I would not be likely to be seeking social reinforcement from her. So it is important for us to change our tone when we are delivering praise, to create contrast. We want our learners to know when we are happy, when we are proud, when we're excited, and we also want them to know when we might feel like they need to try again or that maybe even that you're disappointed or that um, they didn't get it right, that's okay. But there should be contrast. If my feedback always sounds like, wow, awesome. Nope, that's wrong. Try again. That's gonna be really confusing for a learner. So it's important to adjust your voice and tone inflection when you are delivering praise or feedback because our we want our learners to be sensitive to that. We want them to understand that there is contrast in those things. And of course, it's always important to try to remain neutral when you are delivering an instruction. And we say this because you don't want to influence our learners. And we also don't want them to become dependent on the way that you're asking a question. And that speaks to something we're gonna be talking about later on, which is generalization. So if I'm working with a learner and I have two other staff who also work with that learner, I might ask a question or give an instruction like, show me writing. But maybe my colleague says, show me writing. And gives some sort of a prompt. And maybe the third colleague says, show me writing. And we all probably need to communicate about how we are giving our instructions. And it is best practice to remain as neutral as you can when you deliver the instruction. But the second a learner starts to follow the direction to then switch and say, wow, I'm so proud of you. Great job for following my direction. I'm so proud of you for writing awesome work. I hope that makes sense. Here is another point that's important is considering the variety of praise statements. That's super important for us. 
it's important to switch up the praise statements that we use because I feel like this is a good point to be made. I would hate to hear the same note and get the same note from my instructor or from my boss uh, or from a partner or my mom, the same thing over and over again, just saying good work, good work. There's gonna come a time where that's gonna get old. And so there are so many ways to say good job. Um, and here's just a short little list that is a great um, example of different ways you can do it. But we don't want our learners to only respond when being told good job. So it's really important for us to also consider the variety of praise statements that we use. And I make this point because I think of myself and I know for sure that I would really get annoyed with hearing the same thing over and over again. For example, being told, good job, every single time I do something by my boss or my friend or my mom or my partner, and that's gonna get old. I'm gonna stop valuing the phrase good job. So it's super important to switch up our praise statements that we use with our learners. We don't want our students to only respond when being told good job, but we also want to make sure that we diversify our praise statements as often as we can because we always want to be thinking about generalization. If the way that I say good job might be using things like excellent, awesome, way to go, keep it up, fantastic job, is how I say good job, but maybe my colleague says a variety of different other phrases. What we're doing and the goal is, is to teach that learner that all of those things also mean good job. So we want um, to always be thinking about how important it is for that learner to generalize the behaviors in which we're saying good job or great work or wow or um, any variety of praise statements. We want them to generalize that, oh, in the presence of these people, when I do X, Y, and Z, I'm going to be given awesome positive feedback. So keep that in mind when you are programming and thinking about ways to um, provide positive praise to your learners. Let's get some. Okay, so here is an example that maybe some of you have already seen. Um, this is one of my most favorite examples of positive reinforcement. And this is from the show The Big Bang Theory, and this clip was found on YouTube. Um, you can definitely easily access it. But I just wanted to include it for anyone who is new to the concept of positive reinforcement. I find that this clip from The Big Bang Theory is one of the most clear and also very funny examples of positive reinforcement being used to shape behavior. So let's play that clip. finished? Well, thank you. How thoughtful. Would you like a chocolate? Uh, yeah, sure. Sorry, Sheldon, I almost sat in your spot. Did you? I didn't notice. Have a chocolate. <laughs> You're here a lot now. Oh, am I talking too much? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Chocolate? Okay, so I like to use this example because it's super clear what Sheldon is trying to do. He is trying to use a reinforcer that is chocolate, that is probably hopefully, been established in previous episodes. That is a preferred item for Penny. And so he's using chocolate to, he's presenting her chocolate in response to a behavior that he would like to see increase. So he did it when she cleaned up his plate for him, when she apologized for almost sitting in his seat but moving, and also when she was quiet during the show that they're watching because he didn't want her to keep talking. So I think that's a good example of um, positive reinforcement that you can find in the media and also think of how um, he managed, he wanted to use that in uh, to shape her behavior to meet his needs. Um, just a silly example, but helpful and remember, easy to remember. Okay, so next let's talk about 
are two types of negative reinforcement. And again, just as a reminder, our negative, when we say negative reinforcement, we are not talking about something that is bad. So just keep that in mind. And speaking of reinforcement, I do want to give you your first secret code word. So make sure that you have a pen and paper ready or you're writing this in your phone or on your computer. But our first secret code, code word is diamond, spelled D-I-A-M-O-N-D, -D, diamond. And I'm gonna say it one more time. Our first secret code word is diamond. Okay, so I'm gonna keep on going. And remember, you need to have those secret code words in order for you to get access to your CEUs. Okay, so escape is one of our first types of negative reinforcement. An escape can be defined as when a response stops an ongoing potentially aversive stimulus. And aversive just might be something that you don't like, don't want, want to be all done with. When a person is escaping an unpleasant situation. So examples in our everyday life include, uh, for me, getting in my car after my partner's used it and the music is blasting and I immediately turn it right down. I want to escape the loudness um, and so I immediately turn it off. I engage in behaviors of grabbing the dial and putting the volume down. Potentially walking out of a boring lecture, which I really hope no one has already done, but good news is I can't tell if you have, um, but make sure you're back soon so that you can make sure you get that second <laughs> secret code word. But all jokes aside, walking out of a boring lecture, you are removing yourself from a situation in which you were bored. Hitting snooze on your alarm. I don't do this, um, but I know a lot of people who do this, who it's like a reflex, snooze right when they wake up. I've just never, um, I've never really done it, but it's not, doesn't mean anything about me. It's just, I happen to like mornings. I don't like nights. Um, so it's not a behavior that I typically engage in, but hitting snooze on your alarm stops the aversion of that annoying sound and gets you access to a little bit more sleep. One of the more common ones that I find in my own life is, and I think of this all the time, every time I get in the car, is like how smart were the people who made cars? Um, putting your seatbelt on to turn off that beeping sound. That beeping sound was put there for a reason because you wanna turn it off. You wanna escape that annoying sound. So you're gonna put your seatbelt on to escape the presentation of that aversive stimulus. Um, other examples is walking away from an argument or saying, okay, you're right and then ending a conversation. Or something I oftentimes see um, and hear about from parents is a caregiver giving a child candy when they are screaming in the grocery store. And this, you might be thinking, what? How is that escape? It is not necessarily escape for the learner, it is escape for the parent or caregiver. So a caregiver is trying to escape, let's say the aversion of their child making a scene, people looking at them, um, asking them, do you need help? Um, just generally discomfort of being in a situation like that. So a caregiver might say, okay, okay, I'll just give you the candy if you just stop, which we'll talk about later, what kind of uh, icky things that can create behaviorally. But this is just an example of wanting to escape a situation um, and wanting to remove a stimulus so that you're going to be more likely to do it again in the future because it worked. The second type of negative reinforcement is something we call avoidance. And I have this like funny little meme in here, but I do think it is a good example. It says, my therapist says avoidance is not the answer. Time to stop going to therapy. So when a response prevents or postpones the presentation of a stimulus, that's what avoidance is. So here are two examples that I have seen in my own life and are just kind of uh, things that I thought were good antidotes. So I used to live in Manhattan and I took the same two trains twice a day. And this is an example taken from my own life, pre-COVID, pre pre-moving, and uh, just what I did every day for many, many years. So every day I get on the same train on my daily commute. And that was the D train or it was the Q train. And sometimes that train, in this example, the one train, is extra crowded and always delayed pretty much every day due to repairs. One morning, I'll decide to check the train conditions and see that there happens to be construction on the second train that I take, which is the one train. 
So I decide to take a different route. My action of checking the train conditions was a cue for me to avoid the one train and take another route. So my chain of behavior has helped to prevent or postpone any frustration or um, get having to get stuck on a train that was actually under lots of construction. So that's an example of that. And then here is another one. Jason checks his schedule and sees that he forgot that he had a meeting he did not fully prepare for. Jason goes to the kitchen to make a coffee, maybe chat with a colleague, uses the restroom, takes his time getting back to his office. Jason engaged in that string of behaviors because it effectively postponed the onset of a meeting he was not prepared for. So those are just two kind of everyday examples of avoidance, but we have so many versions of avoidance when we are um, thinking about negative reinforcement. And we're gonna be talking about functions of behavior and why we do what we do. Just keep in mind that this is a concept we're gonna be revisiting. So here are our takeaway points when thinking about reinforcement. How quickly you provide reinforcement is crucial. A response will become more frequent in the future if a reinforcer has followed it within zero to 60 seconds. And I really don't love that that is even that long, but that is what um, is believed to be true within the science and based off of our research, is that within zero to 60 seconds is going to be, it's going to be the most effective. Anything that's longer than that will make the contingency unclear, will delay access to the reinforcer, and will ultimately make it less valuable. And, um, be more challenging to kind of shape the understanding of that contingency. What happens right before the reinforcer is given is what will be reinforced. So really keep, keep that in mind. Let's say, for example, we are doing color identification with a student who is using a token board and that student earns token number 10. The reinforcer should be ready and accessible as soon as they have answered or finished the last task and earn that last token. If not, here's what can go wrong. Okay, the learner earns their last token. They are working, they were working for access to a slinky. But if another learner might be playing with that slinky and they're not finished with it yet, there you, there you go, you're delaying that time. So keeping that in mind, or let's say they're working for a snack that you need to go all the way to the kitchen to go get, and maybe they ran out and actually you don't have any more. And then anything that was, positively reinforced by earning that allotless token, the contingency is broken. And so it becomes unclear and it might actually kind of taint um, what you are trying to do with your learner. So keep that in mind that the access to reinforcement should be quick and, you know, think of it in your own life. I feel like for myself, things that are difficult for me are hard for me to do um, include, I'm not like a super strong swimmer. Um, it's something that I get very anxious doing and I'm um, something that I'm really working on now that I live in Florida and something that my partner has put in place for me, <laughs> a reinforcement system rather, is um, any time that I go into the ocean with him and practice swimming, we will go and get a preferred snack afterwards. And that happens very fast. He's either planned ahead and has it with us. So maybe it's something like an ice pop um, or a preferred snack like chips or something. And it's in his bag and he's ready for me. And I know it sounds silly because I'm an adult and I can do that. But it is super crucial for me to make the connection of when I go to the beach and I practice swimming, I do get other fun things. And it's important to remember that for our learners, because we don't want to delay their access to something, especially if they're learning like a new skill or something that's really challenging where they need, where we really rely heavily on creating that contingency of when I do the thing, I get this really fun thing and my world changes and everything is great and I'm excited. So I want to keep that in mind as a takeaway point. Here are some misconceptions about positive and negative reinforcement. And I want to say this from a place of knowing that this is a complex concept and that there are going to be parents and caretakers, babysitters, grandmothers, <laughs> therapists, teachers, all of the above, who may say to me, I disagree. And I say to you, that's okay. I, what I'm presenting to you is what the research and the science of applied behavior analysis discusses as positive and negative reinforcement. This is not me bribery shaming. 
This is me just kind of explaining to you the difference between the two. And I understand that there are situations you got to just do it for survival, and that is okay. Just want to put that disclaimer out there. Positive reinforcement is often confused with bribery. Bribery is beneficial to the person giving the bribe and not necessarily to the learner. When we're thinking about the context of working with um, learners who have you know, certain types of needs and specifically not thinking of the examples of like watching gangsters in a movie or um, watching people who do bribes for a living. I just, I hope you're getting what I'm saying in the sense of try not to think about this in such a grand scope because of course it can be applied in different ways and in a different context. But in the context of thinking about working with children, working with children who are on the spectrum, working with children with complex needs, working with children of all types, thinking about some time, most of the time, the science shows that bribery is beneficial to the person who is giving the bribe and not always to the learner. Yes, in some way they are getting something out of it, but it's actually more beneficial to the person giving the bribe. So an example, Bribery occurs after or while a behavior is happening. Positive reinforcement, on the other hand, is something that you're going to describe prior to going or doing something. So, for example, saying, first, we're going to go to the grocery store. When we leave the grocery store, I will get you um, a special toy because you've made it through the grocery store trip. And that's amazing. And I want to reinforce that. However, Bribery is something along the lines of, if you stop screaming right now, I will give you candy. It's catching the behavior when it's happening and addressing it in the moment and telling them to stop, telling the behavior to be turned off. And if it turns off, you will give them something. Again, this is not the same thing as paying someone money to do something for you in a business or in a thinking of many movies where bribery is, is a common theme in the context of education, in the context of development, and in applied behavior analysis specifically, positive reinforcement is the presentation or adding of something to increase the likelihood of a behavior occurring under similar contexts in the future. And bribery is always gonna be considered something that occurs while a behavior is happening um, or after it's already happened. So just keep that in mind. And we already talked about this earlier, but just to highlight again, negative reinforcement is often confused with a punishment just because of the word negative. But as my little meme shares, negative reinforcement and punishment are not interchangeable terms. They're just not. So in the case of applied behavior analysis, negative simply means, like we said earlier, taking away something to either increase or decrease a target behavior. Again, unfortunately, some of these words in behavior analysis are words we already associate with something else. Okay, now it's time for part two of our presentation, which is where we're going to be discussing ABC data. So what are ABC data? And I say what are versus is um, because ABC data are a multitude of things. It's not just like one sheet of paper or one um, graph that we're reading. It is a multitude of things. And I was just trained by some really excellent behavior analysts who kind of drilled that in me that we say data are. So if you hear me say that and you're like, why is she saying that? I just want you to know, that's my background in that. So ABC data are a descriptive way to collect information on specific behaviors of interest. You are specifically looking at the antecedent, the behavior and consequence of a specific behavior. There's that word consequence, it's back. And I promise you, I encourage you to think of it in a way that doesn't feel negative, just in the context of this conversation for today. ABC data is always collected before a behavior plan can be put in place. Data are collected only when behaviors of interest are observed. Data are often collected for behaviors that are prim primarily maladaptive or might be impeding learning, but that's not always the case. That's just the more common um, reason for be collecting ABC data. ABC data is used to help determine the function of behaviors, which we're going to be talking about more. We want to get information on the conditions in which behaviors are most likely to occur and to understand the why. So 
what I want you to try to make the connection is when someone says ABC data, I want your brain to switch and say, okay, we're looking for the why. We're looking for why something is happening. And that that's going to really get you in a place of trying to under, of understanding why we do what we do. Okay, so in that first chain of behaviors, we have, like I said, ABC data. We're looking at the ABC model of behavior. In the A column is what we call antecedents. Antecedents are any events that come before a behavior. They are sometimes called triggers, and that's the, they are synonymous. And antecedents are the event in the learner's immediate environment that comes right before the occurrence of a behavior. Some examples of antecedents include terminating a preferred activity, saying it's time to clean up, maybe a loud or unexpected noise, um, sometimes singing a song that isn't preferred um, loudly might be a trigger. I mean, this list is not exhaustive. Transition to a different room or a different activity, maybe a different bus pickup in the morning or a change in schedule, um, and the presentation of a demand. And like I said, this list is very small and is always gonna grow dependent on your learner. Um, and there, the different examples will not look the same for one particular child to the next. Um, but I like using this little visual of the chains because in antecedent and behavior consequence, when you're looking at the big picture, it's important to know that they are extremely linked. Behavior. So when we're talking about behavior, I want to just um, make sure that we uh, make this distinction because I oftentimes hear in schools when I'm consulting um, the term or behavior being thrown around as a verb and also as a noun. <laughs> so I just want to make that kind of disclaimer that when you say, oh, Johnny had a behavior or Mary was behavioral today, as a behavior analyst, that makes me um, kind of crazy. And it makes me um, try to scramble to understand what does that mean? What do you mean he had a behavior? What was the behavior? Can you define it for me so that if I can close my eyes, can I see it? Do I know what it looks like? So I just want you to keep that in mind when you're describing a learner or your child um, or a client, whatever that might be, to really avoid saying things like that, that he was behavioral today or um, that they had a lot of behaviors. Because I want to encourage you to be objective and concise specifically when talking and defining behavior, because the goal is is always to be able to describe something to a bunch of people in a room and for you to all be able to know what you're looking for and to know exactly what something is going to look like. So behavior is any observable, any observable events. Everything we do is behavior. If it passes the dead man's test, it is behavior. And that is just like something that um, we I learned in graduate school um, and was a concept that was really helpful to me. If a dead man can do it, it is not behavior. Um, and if a dead man can't do it, it is behavior. So just a good anecdote for you to kind of keep in mind. Um, so some examples, walking, crying, hitting, laughing, talking, screaming, chewing, cooking, dressing, breathing, playing. Maybe throwing things or breaking things, uh, kicking, dancing, eating, drinking, throwing a ball, you know, laying down, uh, reading a book, all those things are considered behaviors. And it's really important. I, we don't talk about this a ton in this presentation, but I am very, very passionate and really believe that um, it is something that I want you, I want to share with you is it is extremely, extremely important and valuable to define behavior in a really clear way. So to just say that a child had a behavior without um, giving a proper explanation of what it is, is a disservice. So just keep that in mind. Here we go. <laughs> Defining and describing behavior. So again, this is going to be, um, I'm on my soapbox now, but this is really important. So please pay attention. Um, when selecting a behavior of interest for ABC data collection, you will need to develop an operational definition. An operational definition is just a 
very clear, objective, and concise definition of what a behavior should look like or what a behavior does look like and what we should be looking for. It also should be easy to understand and it should include examples and non-examples. When reading an operational definition of a behavior of interest, the person reading it should be able to understand exactly what they're observing and collecting data on. There should leave no room for subjectivity, and it's better to include more information than less to reduce observational drift. And observational drift is just a very complicated way of saying using your own opinion. And in the science of applied behavior analysis, we acknowledge that everyone has an opinion, but everything is going to be concrete and based off of um, observation and off data. So I do want you to, to keep that in mind, and I'll give you an example. Um, let's think of something like drinking water, right? So if um, I am trying to define what drinking water looks like, I might say, anytime Marissa drinks water, well, that's not super clear, but sure, maybe it's the average person, they might know what that looks like. But let's say um, drinking water is a target behavior that we're trying to increase, that we want um, to increase the amount of water intake a learner might have because they might be dehydrated or you might be working on um, them just increasing your fluid intake, things like that. We want to be super objective in describing what it is that it's going to look like because I might actually take a sip and spit it out. I might take a sip and kind of dribble it down my face. And that's not drinking. That is spitting and dribbling it down my face. So it's important to be objective and clear and concise and easy to understand when talking about drinking water. So it might be um, any instance in which Marissa puts her mouth to her water bottle and sips it back and keeps the water in her mouth for up to five seconds and swallows. That might be an example, but you're including the amount of time, you're including what it looks like. Then you might also include a non-example. A non-example of drinking water would be anytime Marissa puts her water bottle by her mouth, puts water in her mouth and spits the water onto the table. Um, that's an example of a non-example of drinking. And, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse here, but I think that it's important to think of the way that we define things. So um, I hope that, that is clear. Okay, so the last point in our linked ABC data model is the consequence. And again, consequences are any event that occurs after a behavior. And you're going to be identifying consequences that help us to determine the function of a behavior. And the function is so, so important because function, as a reminder, is the why. Why do these things occur? Why is Johnny doing that? Why is Marissa doing that? Um, it helps to identify why it's happening. And so when we look at this big picture of the A and the B and the C, when we have that big picture consistently and we're taking consistent data, we look for patterns and we can kind of get a sense the more often we're collecting this data, we get a sense of the context in which a behavior is going to be more likely to occur so that then we can put supports in place to give an alternative or to teach them to use functional communication, to ask in a different way. Um, there are so many things that we can do once we determine function, but that's going to be your first step in behavior modification. So examples of consequences include telling a child, you don't have to do it anymore, kept the demand going, gave child a hug, gave child an easier task, gave child something to distract them with, changed environments, gave a child a few more minutes to play, or gave child a break. And these are non-judgmental consequences. Sometimes I find when I'm collecting ABC data from, from parents, they're always like, oh, I don't like that I'm writing this as my consequence. I, I know I shouldn't have told them that they didn't have to do it, but I did. And that honesty is so, so important from teachers and parents and therapists because that's the, that's the truth. It's a clear picture and that's what you need because in that context, we might be learning, okay, when mom tells Johnny to clean up his dinner, he starts to engage in certain behaviors that might make mom want to escape those behaviors. So she says something like, oh, it's okay, it's okay, you don't have to, you can have one more minute. And that's okay. These are important things, but then we need to learn how can we teach 
Johnny to not engage in those behaviors and to do something as an alternative to ask for more time or, or to meet his needs. Okay, so now we're gonna dive into functions of behavior, which is, as you can remember, is our why. And we're thinking about why we do what we do. And this is going to be something we focus on once we've determined our operational definition and have collected consistent ABC data. Then we can determine why a behavior might be occurring. And I want you to think about it in the framework of what is the payoff for a behavior? What is someone gaining or getting or avoiding or escaping? Um, what is the payoff for engaging in a certain set of behaviors? And there are four functions of behavior in applied behavior analysis. And here's another acronym for you called SEAT, which is S for sensory, also known as automatic, E for escape, escape from demands, and A, attention, and T is for tangible. So here is a fun visual that I like um, that shows these, uh, the functions of behavior. So we have sensory, what it does, what does it do? And I'm gonna break this down even further, but I do like this visual as a support. Um, so sensory, it provides stimulation in the pleasure zone of the brain, right? So for me, um, it's biting my nails or it was at a time twirling my hair. Um, especially when I was in graduate school, I would, I would do a lot of this, like hair twirling, and I would um, <clears throat> really be distracted and I'd be self-soothing in a lot of ways because I was very anxious in grad school. If you've been in grad school, you know it. Um, it's an anxious time for sure. And if it isn't good for you, very, very jealous. Um, but I engaged in a lot of like hair twirling and definitely biting my nails a bit. And when does when do sensory behaviors happen? Anytime. Um, and I'm going to talk about this further, is that these are the behaviors that happen without anybody else needing to be around. They're going to happen naturally. And you can uh, um, ignore right now just the what to do column because that's going to be something we're going to be talking about in our next presentation. So right now we're just looking at the different functions and what, what they are. Then we have escape, which removes undesired activities, interactions, or situations. Um, attention, providing access or awareness to or from people um, or interactions, and tangible, providing preferred items or activities. So here we have our sensory or automatically reinforcing behavior. I'm just going to talk about that a little bit further. So it's any type of behavior that occurs independent of a specific environment or other people. There are those behaviors that would occur if and when a learner was in a room without any toys, without any peers or adults, or without any additional variables. Sensory maintained behaviors are often the most challenging to eliminate because they're inherently motivating and feel good to the individual. And essentially, they are the behaviors that you have to compete with. You have to compete with them being able to engage in these behaviors. So for me, what really helped was um, I would wear my hair up because of the hair twirling that I would engage in, especially like I would do a lot of presentations like this and I would be playing with my hair the whole time. And I didn't even know that I was doing it, but it was soothing and it would help me. And what helped to reduce that behavior was removing the temptation altogether. And I wore my hair in a bun for about two years, pretty consistently. Um, and it definitely reduced the sensation. It, it definitely re reduced the temptation. And essentially, I just removed um, access to it and I put it in a bun and I couldn't do it. Um, so that was an example in my life. Other examples for sensory behaviors are like biting nails, potentially skin picking, rocking, body rocking back and forth, humming, spinning, hand flapping, engaging in self injurious behaviors, potentially even crossing eyes. Um, those are just a very short list of our sensory and automatically reinforcing behaviors. You might hear words like motor stereotypy and vocal stereotypy, and sometimes those behaviors are gonna be talked about in a sensory or automatically reinforcing sense as well. 
are tangible maintained behaviors. So again, any time a behavior occurs in response to the removal or presentation of a specific tangible item. So an example might be, um, examples of a tangible maintained behavior could be, a student is playing with a toy, but it's time to clean up. And so the timer goes off and the student is told, it's time to clean up your toy. And then a student might begin to tantrum. And so when you're looking at that from a, looking at the why, well, the learner wants more time. They wanna keep playing with their item. They don't wanna end the activity. And so that tangible item um, is maintaining that them engaging in that behavior. And it, I do wanna make this point, I'm gonna say it again many times later and in our next presentation, but when we're looking at the why, very rarely is it just one answer. Most often, especially thinking of this example, this learner was playing with a toy. And so when we look at the context, okay, toy, toy, tangible, great. And they engage in a behavior in the response of needing to remove that toy. However, they also might engage in tantruming because they don't want to clean up and do work or they don't want to transition to go to the next activity. And that could be a escape from demand um, payoff. So just keeping that in mind, and I'm going to repeat it a lot more as we continue, is that um, there's very rarely just one why. Another example. A student is working for 10 tokens to earn access to the iPad. The learner gets app tokens when sitting nicely, listening to directions, and having safe hands. The learner earns 10 tokens and is presented the iPad. That student is more likely to engage in those positive behaviors versus engaging in challenging behavior if they are motivated for the iPad. Here we have our attention maintained behavior any behavior that occurs as a result of gaining a form of social attention. This means that when a student engaged in a specific behavior, attention was given. And so the behavior that occurred right before attention was ultimately reinforced. So some common attention maintained behaviors include cursing, crying, hitting, whining, hair pulling, tantrums, those big ticket behaviors, um, saying a caregiver's name over and over and over and over again, screaming, threatening others, maybe property destruction, um, self-injurious, and so forth. Behaviors that are attention maintained often are what are bringing adults closer to them. So just keep that in mind. Next, we have our escape maintained behavior. So any behavior that results in escape, removal, or delay from a specific environment, demand, or situation. So some examples of escape maintained behaviors, and this list can go on and on, is elopement or running away, dropping to the floor, covering face, just refusing, just saying, absolutely no, nope, I'm not doing it, I'm putting my head down, no, 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 I'm not doing it, screaming, tantruming, property destruction, um, aggression, and again, these are just some of those more big ticket behaviors that signal that a child is trying to escape a situation or demand or something in their environment. So before we tie up this presentation, I do want to make the, the note that we this is very foundational. I did not want to dive too deep into these concepts because we have a part two coming. So this was really an introduction to reinforcement to functions of behavior and ABC data and why we collect it. And next time, we're going to be talking more in depth of what the ABC model really allows us to infer and what to do when you've determined a function. What strategies can you put in place to increase or decrease a behavior, maintain a behavior, proactive, reactive, preventative, all of those strategies that are so, so important when working with our learners. That is what we're going to be talking about next time. So I really hope that you tune in. So here are some special considerations for this presentation is that it can, sometimes it can be very clear after taking ABC data that a behavior is maintained by a specific function, but an intervention and that an intervention can be developed and put in place. That is like a perfect world where we're like, great, we figured it out. And now we have a perfect intervention that we can put in place. But there are times when a behavior is multiply maintained or occurs most often under a few conditions or sometimes under all of the conditions. 
which sounds nuts that we're like, what, what do you do? How do you even manage that? How do you put in an intervention? I promise you there are ways to do it. It's lots of trial and error, and it does create a challenge of finding the best possible intervention, but it's absolutely possible. Just keeps us on our toes. Here are the sources from today's presentation. And I wanted to say thank you. Please feel free to follow us, us on social media. And you can also send me an email if you have any questions or feedback for me at marissa.ek at lsforautism.org. It's M-A-R-I-S-S-A dot E-C-K at lsforautism.org. And I really hope that you stuck around for those secret code words and have them and so that you can get those CEUs that you rightfully deserve. We're sitting through this presentation. I hope you got a lot out of it and I hope to see you for part two. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day and I will see you next time. Bye.